So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Aisha. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. We're delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to actually come down. Can everyone see me? All right, the topic uh, of today's presentation is smart cities. And um, we're going to talk about smart cities, but we're going to start with talking about the two major trends that are happening in the world that are driving this resurgence of cities and this importance of adding urban intelligence to cities. Then we're going to actually talk about what exactly is a smart city. And we're going to go through some approaches to smart cities that we've seen in the last couple of years that we've been visiting these projects. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about governance and how to govern um, smart projects. So let's start with the first one, which is my area of speciality, which is technology. Now, we all intuitively feel that technology is becoming more important in our lives. Let's really think about the fact that the nature of technology is changing. First of all, these are not discrete objects that I can hold and you can hold. Very soon, it will become ubiquitous. And this will happen in the form of sensors. Sensors are very tiny, almost machines, if you think of them as, uh, that constantly react to and capture data. They used to be about $20 a piece. Uh, Ten years ago now, they're about $1 a piece. Their price is constantly going down. In a smart city, a square foot of built infrastructure can have as many as 80 sensors on it. Um, it's gathering data on everything from heat and light and movement. Now, what happens is that when technology is ubiquitous, it means you have human-machine interfaces everywhere. It's also becoming intelligent. So we are used to being the ultimate arbiters of knowledge. Um, we use our smartphones and our laptops as devices where we add value to it. But very soon, we'll see personal assistant avatars in our smartphones. We'll see the building itself becoming intelligent. And so this, again, is going to play very heavily into the creation of smart cities. And then finally, they're becoming social. And this is really important. A big trend that's happening is what is known as social robotics. How do you make human-machine interaction natural? So the Kinect <coughs> software, um, it's all gesture-based. Now it's going to be voice-activated. And when it's social, you trust the machine. You are vulnerable to forming an emotional relationship. When you trust it, and it's in your building, it's in your city, you give it a lot of information. So in this background, let's think about um, human technology patterns of interaction and really think about where it started. It started in the Stone Age. 250,000 years ago, Homo sapiens roamed the Earth. They used stone tools to dominate other species. Then about 10,000 years ago, we started um, crop cultivation, animal husbandry. We used the plow, the wheel. We actually became sedentary. 5,000 years ago, as a result of that, the first cities appeared in the world. Then 250 years ago, a lot of the scientific breakthroughs that happened during the Renaissance were able to reach the mass market. And with um, inventions such as a steam engine, we had mass consumption, mass production, we had rapid urbanization. <clears throat> and this is the age we're most familiar with, right? This is the information age. In the late 70s, we had the birth of the PC, then we had the birth of the World Wide Web in 1989, now we live in a time of data. We can create and exchange knowledge easily. So we are knowledge workers. We have a knowledge economy. And each technological revolution, each time technology changed, it created a whole new way of living for humanity. And now we are entering a new age again. Because technology is changing, it's becoming ubiquitous, intelligent, and social, we are entering the hybrid age. And in the hybrid age, Every single thing that we do, including our personal relations, and we're already seeing that in Facebook, are mediated by technology. You can also see how most of the leading economic centers are actually concentrated in the West. But now, population growth, economic growth, you're seeing most of them in the South and the East of the map. So this, when people talk about the shift of power from, east to, from West to East, what are they saying? Or how are you seeing that manifest? People just talk about GDP growth and these statistics. Well, here's the physical representation of what is happening, which is this is largely derivative of urbanization because cities really are, more so than countries even today, the centers of power in the world. The fate of a country, the success of a country, the innovative potential of a country hinges on the extent to which it is harnessing, catalyzing, populating, and developing 
in cities. And one of the most important statistics that you can look at for a country is not just its GDP growth, which can fluctuate wildly, just think about the financial crisis. What you can look at is the share of their budget that is spent on infrastructure, because that is one of the top economic indicators of sustained long-term growth. What share of the budget has been spent on fixed uh, infrastructure, construction, and things like this? And that's happening very much in the East. So where do these two trends come together? What do emerging technologies and a high rate of urbanization need? They meet in smart cities. And so what is a smart city? A smart city is one in which you use network infrastructure, which constantly collects data from you, from its environment, and then is able to give you services which are streamlined, whether it's your building or whether it's traffic. So let's take traffic, for example, collecting data on congestion in traffic, and then dynamically changing the lights, the traffic lights, to facilitate very smooth um, traffic flows. Uh, let's look at digital profiles, all your preferences stored in a central database. And when I mean central, it can be distributed, such as uh, Facebook and Amazon and Apple all have your profiles stored in them. Increasingly, we are moving towards a time of one digital identity. And then smart security. Already we have cameras in London, we have hundreds of thousands of them uh, being planned for China, and then also in Singapore, we're going to see this more and more. In Songdo, where um, where even the trees have sensors on them. So they will tell you when they need more drink. And this is the level of uh, intelligence that is being added, and this is directly driven by the fact that you have sensors, then you have a cloud, where the city services are constantly crunching data, and then they respond to you. Um, the easiest way to think of it is that a city is constantly listening to you and speaking back to you, so it's like the app store. It's like city as a platform. Imagine just like you have lots of apps for iPhone, you have lots of apps for the city. Some of them are funded by the government, some of them by the private sector. So now let's look at smart cities. They project, um, researchers, that about $500 billion will be spent in creating smart cities in the world. So it's very big business, and most people think that's an understatement. In fact, high research thinks that $100 billion will be spent just by 2020. So that's a huge investment that's going in. And there are two kinds of cities. One are called greenfield cities. That means cities that are created from scratch. So hundreds of new cities coming up, especially in emerging markets. And the other are brownfield cities, like Toronto, like New York, where a city exists and you need to add layers of information infrastructure on it. If you look at its mobile infrastructure, uh, you have Austin, Texas where it's a very small project, which is 300 families, and they're testing the smart grid over there. And then you have Rio, where IBM just put in an operational center, which is a central dashboard, by which they can see when mudslides are going to happen in favelas, and then coordinate between hospitals to know how many rooms you may need, and the police to know where you should rush to save people, and the meteorologists and the university professors who actually will be able to predict landslides. Um, and you can imagine in Rio, that's just a few departments, imagine they're extending over time to the entire city. So this all sounds very good, right? Uh, life sounds really awesome, you have um, all these great services, it's all network, and this is what Cisco and IBM and HP will tell you is great. But there are many, many trade-offs that you need to think about. So here is what's happening. Your promised connectivity, security, efficiency, sustainability. Sustainability is very big in uh, smart city conversations. But we're human beings. We need freedom, we like culture, privacy, serendipity, happiness. When you construct a techno platform for a city, um, that doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean you get a great city. It just means you get a platform that can enable you to do some of these things. So when a city is constantly gathering data on you, it's basically saying, hey, um, I'll give you convenience and security, and in exchange, you'll give up your privacy. This is a false choice. You should be able to opt into these services, not have them as defaults that you have to opt out of. This is why there's so much fear over what Facebook is doing. Facebook, if you go, it by default enables facial recognition so that your friends can tag you. But really, it should give you the option to opt into it. So this is very important, that you, are, you have to be very careful that you're not signing new social contracts. 
Let me give you an example. In Japan, did you know that there is one vending machine for every 23 people in Japan? They love vending machines, right? They're all over the place. And uh, this is a smart vending machine. So when you move towards this vending machine, it scans you and it assesses your age and your gender with 75% accuracy. And once it does this, it crunches away and sees, okay, somebody of this profile only likes X number of drinks. So maybe you're a little different. Maybe you're quirky and you like uh, Red Bull. But based on the average profile, it will never offer you Red Bull. It will only offer you Coke. <laughs> and so this is very dangerous. It's already there in Tokyo. Imagine now, the more the city gathers information on you, the more it's deciding for you. And uh, it's very important, and we'll talk about this later, to have some kind of civic activism and transparency around what intelligence and data analytics can do in a city. We call that kind of uh, vending machine not big brother, but big mother, because it's basically <laughs> bossing you around without you even knowing it. Um, so, as I should rightly is implying, you just having the smart technologies doesn't mean the city itself is smart. There has to be a human element to it that is the foundation of what a smart city is all about. In other words, the human being is the asset that the technology needs to advance. So we believe that a smart city, and creating a good definition and typology of smart cities, focuses on them being human-centered, but also future-forward. So this is sort of our working definition of the smart city being an effectively networked infrastructure, focusing on the high quality of life through a platform of services uh, that enable uh, engagement and innovation and sustainability. So here, again, what you have in this definition is that technology alone doesn't define the, the ecosystem of the city. Rather, it is very much the people who define it. And not only is it that you, that you create metrics around the enhancement of individual life in the cities, but that platform has to be open, it has to be dynamic, it has to be flexible, it has to be able to incorporate new technologies in ways that are driven by the users themselves. So it's not simply a matter of, of building something new and having it be a final product, because technology is, after all, evolving so rapidly that this platform has to be able to incorporate that. There is no real end, is there, to our technological evolution. So a smart city is one that is ready to compete, not just today, when it opens, but even 10 years from now. So let's think a little bit about urban intelligence. And this is from Pike Research, and we actually agree with it. It's quite similar to some of the things we are thinking about. So if you think about the smart city, you think about it having an operating system. This is the platform. This is your app's um, infrastructure. This is what Apple has, the iCloud. It has all your sensor networks, your data analytics, all your intelligent devices. Um, and it gets more abstract as you go up. Once you have this infrastructure, then you can start to, uh, to go through your government departments and begin to add intelligence. You can have utilities, buildings, government services, voting, uh, driver's licenses, uh, healthcare, all uh, as services on top of this operating system. And finally, based on that, you can get to the next level, which is then you can go for goals that are environmentally sustainable and especially in citizen well-being and also economic viability. And I think it's very important to think this way. I actually was speaking to the head of civil services in Singapore, and uh, he said that it's very important. He said a smart city cannot be too smart for its citizens. And I really like that, because he was saying, if you look at the older demographic, Aisha, you really need to educate them. And with the aging population of the world, you have to be very sensitive about how you introduce these things. And so you have to have the urban design and the policies that, that help the transition uh, for older people um, into, into this era of urban intelligence. So now let's look at some specific smart cities and projects that we've been visiting. And I was just in, uh, in Portugal, in Porto, and it's beautiful. I don't know if you've been there, but it's a beautiful little city. It doesn't look very smart or very futuristic, but, um, but this is a picture of the city. They have uh, not broken ground yet, but very close to where this picture is, they're building a brand new city. And I think that Planet Valley, which is, has been started by Steve Lewis, who was at Microsoft, is the most technologically advanced smart city that's going to be built in the world. It's really driven from the ground up as thinking about cities as software, which means it's pieces that can come together and are linked together with data. So Steve Lewis calls it the urban operating system. 
And he has built this as a lab for small cities, which means that he's getting 60,000 families who are the families of employees from Cisco and IBM and also HP, and they're going to come together and they're going to experiment and, de and actually develop apps for smart cities. And by 2015, which is just three years from now, three, four years from now, they're going to have 60,000 families over there. This is very interesting. They're designing the city first in silico. So as architects and as uh, for myself, the computer scientists, you know, you often design things, you often map it out, but imagine an entire city which is going to be designed and experimented with and tweaked in silico in the computer so that you can see how everything will work together and how things will react to each other. I'm working on a health application and we're actually going to test it in the simulated city. So it's like SimCity, essentially. Um, and so when they actually start building, what are they going to do? I don't know if you know this, but the construction industry is very, very wasteful. In fact, apparently there are no two buildings that are exactly alike in the world. And Bob Eccles, who's at Harvard Business School, um, went and went to Plant Valley, and he was so impressed that he actually wrote a case study on it, and on how it's going to revolutionize the construction industry by actually uh, using modular, efficient, and affordable blocks that can be put together. And each block of that building will have will be wired with sensors and be wired with whatever networks you need. And wherever you want, you can just take pieces out and put pieces out in. And all the services over there will be available via the cloud. The cloud has become very popular. Apple just released the iCloud. It's just iCity. It's the equivalent cloud for crunching city services. So how does this get financed? I was just on the morning show this morning on CBC, and we were talking about Toronto, and, uh, and Matt Galloway asked me, this looks really expensive. Like, how are they doing this? And it is expensive. You know, it costs billions of dollars. And it's really through public-private partnerships. So if you look at Portugal, what Portugal has done is it's declared um, Planet Valley a project of national importance, PNI, and it has set up a separate municipal agency that is there to streamline all the regulations that they need to lease the land and to build it, and that all the different partners that want to have businesses there are actually paying for it. And they're very thoughtful about it as well. They have been talking about, I, I really pushed them in privacy. I was just there two weeks ago. And uh, he said, so I come into the city, am I going to you know, be shuttered into a room where they'll tell me these are the different um, big dashboards, these are the different services that you have? Um, and they said it would be very similar to that. Let's say you wanted to live in Planet Valley. You would go in, you would get a digital profile, you would log in, and then it would say, you know, these are X number of services you can have. You can have the security cameras watch you and your wife and your lover and your children. Uh, and you may not want that, but if you have kids, uh, then you can also watch them. And you can make sure they're safe in the park and they're safe in your school. So there's a, there's a big tension here between privacy um, and security. And then it's interesting, right? We're talking about Jane Jacobs and this idea that diversity is necessary for a city. And Alex Haddad, who's over here, and uh, is uh, the head of e Health Innovation at the University of Toronto, went and inspired uh, the people over there to really look beyond the technology, because they are really geeky, and really think about what makes a city. People make a city, happiness makes a city. And so when I was there, they invited four leading artists from Lisbon, and they said, tell us about the public spaces we should have, about the arts and cultural institutions we should have. And it was very artsy and, and dramatic. And I think they got a little bit of it, but, but the fact that they're engaging with this is very, very good. Because we know that what makes a city successful is its diversity and its culture. I'm going to give a brief example about what exactly one could expect in a smart city. So let's look at this woman. She's at home. She doesn't look very happy, but you will be happy if you're not at home. <laughs> it's just the picture. Um, so let's say she goes to work and she comes back. She comes back in the evening, she likes to have mood lighting, and she likes a little bit of music. Uh, and then she cooks, and when she's done cooking, she likes to put her lights off and sit by her desk and have the light on and she reads a magazine. Now, she would have to do this every single day in her apartment today and in any apartment she has in Toronto. But if it's a smart apartment, the sensors will record that preference. And when she comes home, the lights will automatically go down at that time. And they will come on and off at the times that she seems to stick to her routine. 
Now she can change it. But the idea is if she moves to another apartment, that same preference goes with her. Let's say she likes to exercise in the morning, or she likes to do certain things. Um, this is the kind of thing which will be really embedded, this kind of intelligence, in, and this is a very simple example, but it's very relevant to, to in a very personal way. Um, and in Songdo, actually, you have telepresence monitors. So they're huge monitors, and you can use them to communicate and work remotely with, uh, with your office mates. We started to break them down into something of a more useful typology. So the next element of it is the real estate driven model for a smart city. Now, New Songdo City in Korea has become synonymous for most people uh, as sort of the big leading smart city project of the world. It's certainly been the most ambitious. It's actually the accidental marriage, though, of the Korean government plans together with its largest engineering and construction firm, Costco with a latecomer to the field at all, Gale International, a property developer based in New York, that only recently began to brand itself as green. And through this accidental, almost uh, stumbling sort of alliance, they started to develop New Songdo City in Korea. Now this is located uh, about 50, 60 miles west of Seoul, which is a very congested and traffic you know, heavy city, and much closer to the airport. So they, they, they very much meant it to be a international business hub, again, close to the airport built on reclaimed land from the uh, Yellow Sea. Now, the fourth actor that's come in beyond the uh, federal government, the local government, the property developer, is Cisco. Cisco, the IT company, has gotten involved and really relocated, uh, you know, created, set up a big presence there of management and technology providers. The telepresence monitors that I just mentioned are, of course, a Cisco product, uh, which they're installing into many of the residential units there. So. Together, what they've agreed is that they want to have all buildings be LEED certified. Uh, it represents a very uh, sort of impeccable urban plan. When we went there, you know, there's a, there's a central park, a concert house. There is a uh, new international school, which has, again, telepresence monitors for kindergartners, and even they're going to hand out iPads to all of the first graders. So, you know, it's meant to be this sort of perfect, uh, perfect place. Again, it is the smart city that's closest to fruition. It will sort of open its doors, you know, in the next couple of years. And yet, that's what allows you to see what happens when plans meet reality. Because there's always political risk involved. There's a situation brewing right now where people are starting to see some of the, the flaws in the model. Let's take a couple of examples. First, the local government insists that uh, in order to even have a property there, you have to go through a lottery system because it has been very popular. Except all, it's only in Korean. So only Korean people even know how to go about this process of even getting a, a property there in the first place. So how do you make a place an international business center attracting lots of Americans and European talent if they can't even get a place there, right? Um, another issue has been over financing, right? It hasn't been clear as to to what extent uh, a lot of the major smart green technology you know, sort of infrastructure is going to be financed by the prospective gains on the real estate versus the upfront investment that was expected that the government would be making. So there have been some tensions around that as well. So you see there's a couple of uh, uh, you know, difficulties or stumbling blocks that emerge uh, when the rubber hits the road. Another example is uh, Moscow. Now this uh, in, in, is a district of Abu Dhabi. And some of the, some of the dots that we had colored black earlier that are sort of new cities, of course, you know, Chongqing is a major uh, Chinese city already, but when entire districts are being set aside, uh, to be built as smart, we're basically saying it's like they're building a new city, especially in a place like Chongqing, which has 35 million people. So one district of it is about going to be four or five million people. That practically qualifies as a new city unto itself. Um, now, Moscow is another example. In Abu Dhabi, one of the major sovereign wealth funds, Mubadala, is uh, sort of ownership over this project in which uh, the goal was to create a whole new district powered with electric vehicles, smart homes, smart grids, uh, all of these kinds of things. But it, too, was very much a real estate-driven project. Uh, MIT was invited in to set up a Mostar Institute and work on issues uh, related to smart energy consumption and measurement and these kinds of things. But what happened with the, with the global financial crisis is as uh, many of the investors who had pre-bought into the properties there, when they pulled out, property prices fell down, all of a sudden, the Abu Dhabi government has really scaled back its commitment to this. You may not see the place be entirely uh, you know, driven around in, you know, by electric cars and things like this. The reality may be much more prosaic. But I, I, you know, given that the, the Persian Gulf governments do have so much money, they will surely continue with the Mostar project. Um, but again, you know, so it, it, the key differentiator there is 
you can see in the financing structure how much genuine political commitment there is to making the city ultimately be smart. But of course, it is wonderful to see a project like this in the Middle East, where you would otherwise say they have no, no actual need to do this. Now, another model is just a sheer population-driven one. Now, we've talked several times about the astounding rate of urbanization in China and the extent to which they need to, they, they by necessity, have to build dozens and dozens of new cities. This is happening a lot already on the coast, but now in very inner parts of the country. In fact, part of what's called the Chinese property bubble today is the development of new cities in Inner Mongolia and places such as this. Meishi Lake, however, is actually going to be a district of Changsha, the capital of Hunan province. And this is meant to be a state-of-the-art district built on about 1,800 acres. Gale International and Cisco, that tag team from Songo, uh, has gotten the contract uh, to develop uh, the Meiji Lake District of, um, of Changsha. Now, they also plan to have lots of these certified buildings, eco-friendly design, a 1.5 million square foot convention center. So the conferences that you go to in China, in Shanghai, Beijing, well, the next one will probably be here. Um, an R&D center, um, water taxis, integrated subways, cultural islands, all of these, again, prefab kinds of things that you can do when you're mapping out an entire city from scratch. Now, this is sort of the startup city model in a way, and that's what's happening around China. As cities compete with each other within China to get the investment, to get the business, to get on the map, to literally get on the map, they are uh, competing with each other in this startup model. So there are other parts of the country uh, north of Shenzhen, as well as an eco-city being developed, Tianjin, outside of Beijing, which is actually already connected really to Beijing through a high-speed rail system is also developing itself into an eco-city. So these are some of the other models of smart cities that are out there. And then, uh, one more is the sort of expansion project uh, or, or sort of redistricting, retrofitting model. And this is uh, Stockholm, uh, where, where I just went to visit a couple of weeks ago. What's fascinating here is that, of course, you think of Scandinavian cities as having uh, prominent harbors and ports, but they too need an infrastructural overhaul. So what Stockholm decided to do is to make really the world's first uh, uh, smart grid system on a waterfront. And it's so advanced, really, compared to other smart grid projects that we followed. Um, ABB, by the way, the Swiss engineering company, is, uh, is the lead partner in this. Um, the electric vehicles, the homes, the appliances in the homes are all going to be connected to this dynamic smart grid in which power is, is really redistributed in real time from where it's needed where it's not during peak and off-peak types of hours. So, you know, literally I saw a working model of this on a, a sort of flat screen that was amazing. And you can actually, will take power from your hair dryer if your hair dryer is plugged in and help to charge another electric car in some other home. It's going to be that sensitive a bit. Because going back to the sensors that Aisha mentioned, um, you know, the more of those you have, the easier it becomes to actually do these things that may sound so incredibly uh, far-fetched. On a macro level, Scandinavian governments are developing these smart grid harbor types of projects to such an extent that given the hydro and wind power resources that they already have in Scandinavia, combined with the smart grid, they will actually extend and connect to the rest of Europe's energy grid and be feeding power literally from northern Europe down to other parts of Europe. So what you see is this feedback mechanism where you don't just build this static smart grid district and let it be. You connect it gradually to the rest of the city, to the rest of the country, and eventually the rest of the continent. And that's how models like this spread. And Scandinavians are very genuine about this. This is not just a, a new harbor just for Swedes. Right? This is really conceived as something that will connect the entire rest of Europe. Okay, so unlike the resource-rich countries in Europe, uh, we come to the poor country, doesn't have a budget, um, and now it wants to add urban intelligence. So what is it going to do? So in San Francisco and New York, the mayors really became excited about um, having smart services and said the best way to do it was to have it bottom up or DIY, do it yourself. And so they held a lot of city app competitions and they encouraged young entrepreneurs to come and have hackathons where they got together and they conceived of new services. Uh, and they said, we'll give you the data will have open data. So in New York, for instance, you have 311 data, where people call all the time with complaints that they have about the city. They report the data, they have it, they said we'll open it up to everyone, and this is a model being followed in the US and also in London. 
both these um, in the UK and, and the US, they're very keen to have the citizens be engaged. I'm going to take one example. 30% of urban traffic in San Francisco is caused by frustrated drivers looking for a parking spot. And it wastes time, energy, and it causes stress, uh, which is typical of any metropolitan city. Now, the uh, city is unable to do something. If, if it was an intelligent city, you know, it would all be networked, the cars would be driving by themselves and would know which parking spots are open. But this is San Francisco. Uh, a company called Streetline said, look, we'll do it. We'll take sensors, we'll embed them in the parking spots, and then we will create a software, an app for the iPhone where you can download it, and then it will tell you wherever the parking spaces are. So the mayor really encouraged this. They just got $15 million in private funding. So it's funded by the private sector, uh, started by interesting, interested citizens and inspired citizens, and this is a public-private partnership model, which is becoming very popular in the U.S. I think there's a bit of a danger to delegate services to citizens, so we have to be a little careful about that, uh, just because uh, the government is responsible for providing infrastructure. So now let's uh, briefly look at the big players in this space. And I haven't really looked at, but there are a lot of architecture firms that are big players as well. I've really looked at just the technology firms, I'm sorry, because that's my expertise. Um, but Cisco, IBM, Accenture, um, uh, Siemens, Ericsson, HP, they're all trying to get into cities. And their ultimate aim is to go to China. Right? All this is for sure. This is like, we can do this, we can do a little project in Austin, a little project here, but really then they run to China, and China does what it does best, it invites them in, it makes them share all their ideas, and then it just steals them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's doing this again and again, and we never learn. <laughs> so, uh, look at Cisco, and they have really cool names, right? So Cisco has smart, smart plus connected communities, and IBM has smarter planet and HP has sense, or are the central nervous system of the Earth. And everybody's some version of smart and intelligent. So um, you, you'll see a lot of these, but like I said, it's really important for, for citizens to be aware of really what these things are doing. And it's hard, right, because we don't really understand technology. Um, I understand technology better than Barack. So, you know, I, I, it's just instinctively one doesn't know some of these things. But Barack is going to talk about governance because um, I think it's really important. So, uh, I should mention that, uh, earlier in the case of San Francisco, you don't want to over-delegate to citizens and, and abdicate the role of government. It seems like an easy thing to do in a time of fiscal uh, crisis, but in fact it may not be the best long-term model because it too can be chaotic. The ideal structure for governance uh, uh, of a smart city environment is this quad. Uh, government plays a role in, in enabling, creating an enabling environment, providing initial investment, providing a good regulatory framework. Um, uh, companies do a lot in terms of the innovation investment. We focused a lot on, on the role that companies play in pr producing these technologies. The educational sector is extremely important, right, to think about what kinds of skills uh, uh, workers are going to need to have in these areas and train accordingly. And increasingly, universities uh, partner with companies to help develop those skills. And of course, civil society, again, uh, to play this role in monitoring what's happening and to play a role and provide the conduits for civic activism. All of them are important. All of them are equally important. Uh, a smart sh city shouldn't be a place where the government does everything, or the companies do everything, or there's Big Brother on one side or the other. It's got to be all of them at the same time. And the smart places that we're seeing, whether it's Stockholm or Singapore, are places where they're getting this balance right and anticipating ahead. Now, we're all familiar with the Bill of Rights. Soon, because most of the world's people live in cities, and the conditions of <coughs> And lifestyle and so forth in cities are, are really unique unto themselves. We've been trying to formulate an urban bill of rights, things like, as I should mention in the beginning, the, the opting in to services rather than being assumed in, right to privacy, public data, smart mobile devices, you know, Wi-Fi has got to be the, the genuine human right that I think we all sort of, you know, uh, 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 are, are, are dying to have, um, clean energy and so forth. And we encourage people to contribute and to add to this list. What would you have? on an urban bill of rights if you were living in a smart city. Uh, last point is about uh, uh, slums. This is smart technology, frugal innovation, it doesn't have to be very expensive, it doesn't have to come entirely from, from Cisco and IBM, is spreading to the slums of the world. In places like Kibera in Kenya, Kushwahidi, uh, uh, and other types of apps have been very important geo mobile geolocating softwares that are helping to map 
and to determine the weaknesses in infrastructure and the needs of peoples, and also to create jobs. Mobile literacy is another major application of urban uh, mobile software and technologies that is also empowering people as far as the favelas uh, of Brazil. So around the uh, emerging world, the developing world, you're going to start to see the incorporation of these smart technologies as well that will develop through, through bottom-up innovations. Thank you very much.